From the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 24th chapter. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. This is the gospel of our Lord. Um, It's been a two-year hiatus, but after a 20-year run, we are going back to Kenya for our vision clinic, and we're really excited about that. Dave DeVore is taking a group of nine people in about three weeks. And I don't care whether you're in the slums of Kenya or whether you are here um, in the United States, at about the age of 40, male or female, you notice that your arms just start to get a little shorter. And what I mean by that is when you're reading your phone or you're trying to read a book, your arms just seem to have to stretch a little bit more in order to clearly see what you need to read. It just happens to all of us. Today, as we look at these prophecies of Jesus, just a few days before he goes to the cross, I want you to think about sight, how important it is to see clearly, how important it is for me to be able to clearly see what's in this book that's close up, but also how important it is for me to see far off too and to be able to do so sort of at the same time. And as we deal with Jesus and his prophecies, we're going to be watching him talk about an event that's going to happen in just 41 years after his death, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, and also ultimately his resurrection from the dead, and ultimately when he comes again at the end of the world to reclaim his people and to declare that final victory. Our lesson starts with the disciples walking away from the Mount of Olives. You hear it. Jesus left the temple, and he was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to all the temple buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked. And so they're marveling at the temple, the disciples. You know, these were fishermen from Galilee, and here they are going to the holy city. And Herod the Great had spent 46 years, an investment of a ton of money, to build this magnificent temple structure that was one of the wonders of the world. Even the Romans were in awe over what Herod the Great had built. It was whitewashed stone on the outside. It was gold inlay up and down and all around the top so that when the pilgrims would be walking to the temple in that hot, sunny, Judean um, climate, they could see it glistening. It truly was the city, the temple of gold. It was an amazing thing, and the disciples were certainly amazed by the temple too. And Jesus then says, do you see all these things? Truly, I tell you, not one stone, these huge stones that you can still see at the wailing wall, not one stone will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. That's kind of the nearsighted part of what Jesus is looking at because just 41 years later in August of AD 70, Titus, the Roman, after just putting up with one Jewish rebellion after another, completely destroys Jerusalem and completely destroys the temple Um, that was known at that time. It was a horrible time. Death and destruction, and it's all prophesied by Jesus. And he said, some of you are still living. It's this generation. It's going to happen. 
And many of the people that Jesus spoke to that day witnessed that destruction of Jerusalem. The disciples came and they asked, I think, a very important question in, chapter, in verse 3. It says, said, as they were then sitting on the Mount of Olives, just overlooking the beautiful temple, the disciples came to him privately and they said, tell us, when is this going to happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And it's that question that all of us do. Well, when? When is this going to happen? This doesn't sound good. What and when is this going to happen? What can we tell? And it's important as we're looking at this to see kind of both. the He's looking in the distance toward the very end. He's looking at also a little closer what's going to happen in 41 years later. And he's also looking at what's going to happen in just a few days. And you're kind of seeing them all in a mishmash in Matthew chapter 24. I want to then go on to um, read a little bit about his prophecy. In ch- verse 12, Jesus says, Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. It's a beautiful promise for us all. And this gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all peoples, and then the end will come. And that really happened to the inhabited world. The gospel went out of Jesus Christ, but it's still going out today. So you kind of see the mixture. Yes, it happened 41 years after Jesus Christ's death, but it also is happening still today. He says, when you see standing in the place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of his house. Let no one in the field go back. You see that the danger was coming. And just as we, in a very graphic way, see the horrors, the horrors that are going on in Ukraine right now, that's been going on for um, years and years throughout the history of the world with wars and famines and all kinds of challenges, it happened to the people of Israel too. Now, verse 26, so if anyone tells you There are the messiahs later on, out in the wilderness, don't go out. Or if they say, here he is in the inner room, don't believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Basically, everyone will see it. Wherever there's a carcass, there the vultures will gather. And immediately after the stress of these days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. The heavenly bodies will be shaken. And then will appear the Son of Man in heaven. And all peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven unto the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree, he says. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it's near right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away away. Again, that long sight. Jesus is going to come. Everybody's going to see him. You can't believe like Jehovah Witnesses who say, well, he was here and we just all missed him. He will be seen by all. And we get back to that question of when. The disciples ask it. People ever since then have been asking when. And Jesus makes it very clear in verse 36. 
But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, Jesus, in his own earthly form at that time, knows. But only the Father. So, one question we ask, when? It's easy to answer. No one knows. No one knows. And anybody who proclaims that they know when the end of the earth is going to come, Jesus says, beware. They don't understand. They don't know. Not the angels, not him and his earthly presence, and only God the Father. So, the next question is, what do we do in between time if we don't know? And he tells us, therefore, keep watch. Because you don't know on what day the Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known on what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and wouldn't have let his house be broken into. So you also need to be ready. You need to be ready for the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time. You have a job to do. In short, it will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Be ready. That's the message of the scriptures. Be ready. Because we don't know when the Lord is going to return. Keep watch is the way that the Bible often says that. And the good news is next week we're going to hear three parables from Jesus. Jesus' own words about how to be ready, how to be prepared. And it gives us a really beautiful picture of what that looks like. Don't want to miss next week about that. I want to tell you what happened a little earlier when Jesus was cleansing the temple. It talks a little bit about being ready. It's recorded in John chapter 2. He had already thrown out the tax, uh, the, 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 the money changers out of the temple. They had turned the temple of God into a den of thieves, as Jesus said. They were not as concerned about the people as they were about their own prosperity. And after Jesus had thrown them out, the temple authorities came to Jesus and said, what sign can you show us to prove your authority that you have the authority to throw people out of the temple, our money changers? And Jesus looked them straight in the face and he answered, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? You're going to build it up again in three days? But the temple, John tells us, that Jesus had spoken of was his body. After he is raised from the dead, then his disciples recalled what Jesus said. And then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. That's how you're ready. It's because of what Jesus did. On that third day when he was raised from the dead, he defeated Satan. On that third day when he was raised from the dead, he showed us that death no longer has the last word. When he was raised on that third day, Jesus showed us and proved to us that he has authority over Satan himself. Jesus is the way we are prepared. You know, after you, you heard it in the uh, first lesson, the first lesson that we had today at the end of the Pentecost sermon, where 3,000 people were baptized. Can you imagine the joy and the excitement that was there? We had just a little bit of that excitement on Wednesday here. But when 3,000 people were baptized that day, and they asked, and they had heard the gospel, and they had heard that they were the ones responsible for Jesus' death, they said, what must we do 
to be saved. It's kind of like asking that question, how are we prepared? And Peter said, repent. Repent of anything you've been doing to try to save yourself. Repent of your sins and forgetting that the Lord is the Savior. Repent and be baptized, just as we witness today, for the forgiveness of sins. And we celebrate in that baptism what God has done for us, of how he has brought us into his family, about a God who so loved the world that he gave his one and only son with that promise that whoever trusts in him Repent and believe. With that, we, God, has prepared us for that last day. Throughout the years, um, these four phrases have been used through the church. Um, We confess them in the Apostles' Creed, but I want to do them line after line because this is our preparation. It is what God has done for us. This is our faith. Repeat after me, Christ has died. Christ Christ is risen. risen. Christ Christ reigns. reigns. And Christ will come again. Christ will come again. That's our hope. That's our certainty. You know, one of the um, things that our family often does during the summertime And this is upon direct orders of my wife, Tammy. It is that whenever we go on a vacation during the summer, it has to be someplace cooler than Austin, Texas. And to be honest, most of the time that's pretty easy. You know, we don't vacation in Phoenix, let's put it like that. But we'll try to find someplace cooler. One of the places that's a little cooler than Austin, Texas during the summertime is going up to the mountains near Fort Davis, the Davis Mountains. Not too far a drive, and it's really a fun place to go to. And one of the things you can do in the evening out there is go to a star party and hear McDon- go to McDonald Observatory, and they show you all the heavens, and they've got all these telescopes, and um, they, they'll do the lectures, and it's just an absolutely amazing experience as you hear about the millions of stars, the billions of miles away. I mean, just... You sit there and you go, you know, God understands all this. I certainly don't, and he's the one who created it. But it gets a little depressing, too, because then they start talking about the death of stars and how they just kind of explode and they go away, and, and you, you look at it and go, oh, my goodness, and then they start talking about the sun, and the sun, well, it only has so many more years, and either it implodes or it explodes, and That doesn't sound too good for my property values, you know, when that happens. And so, you know, you sit there and go, well, that's a little depressing. And so that's what the astronomers are saying. And then you listen to climate scientists. And whether you agree with them or not, you know, at the end of the day, if you listen to them, you know, the earth is getting hotter, as I learned today on the radio before I, I came to work. You know, the carbon dioxide level is going up so much in the ocean. And, you know, it's like the earth will one day look like an unlivable place. And that's kind of the last word that you hear. Or you listen to the words of Jesus where he says, Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and all the peoples on the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. They'll mourn if they haven't put their trust in him. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. God has a plan for each and every one of us. He cares for you. He's coming again. We don't know when. But we do know that in Jesus Christ, as we put our trust in him, 
you and I are well prepared. So keep watch. Keep watch. Let's pray. Lord, as Jesus Christ was going to that cross, he wanted to let us know what was going on. He prophesied what was going to happen in just a few years, but he also prophesied what's going to happen in our future. And Lord, you invite us to keep watch. To keep watch doing what you want us to do, loving you with all our heart and soul and mind and spirit and loving those people around us. And today, Lord, we just thank you for the wonderful blessing that you give, that you give of inviting people to repent and believe and be baptized. And Lord, what a privilege it is as a congregation to be able to share that good news in this community. I want to thank and praise you, Lord, for calling each of the people who have been here today to be part of your family. This earth won't last forever. We won't last forever except in you. Help us to put our trust and our faith in you, the one who has prepared a beautiful future for all who trust in you. We ask this all in Jesus Christ's most holy name and all God's people say, Amen. I want you to see that in action. I've got something I want to show you from Wednesday. Lord, today, thank you. Um, you continue to enlarge your kingdom. People continue to follow you. But most importantly, Lord, in each of these people who were baptized, Whenever they think of their baptism, they think of that great love that you have for them. A God who so loved this world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever trusts in him, his words of life will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Thank you for the celebration that we got to experience today, all in Jesus' name. Amen. That's Redeemer. That's Redeemer at work. 26 kids. 26 kids baptized from the ages of four all the way up through seventh grade. Met with all of them, and they confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's not just a reason to celebrate here on earth. But I know the angels in heaven were celebrating too. And that's a celebration for eternity. Amen. I want you to hear the um, words of the Lord. I'm not going to give you the blessing today. But I invite you to stand and hear the words of the Lord as we sing them together. The blessing. Amen. 